Welcome to the YouTube channel of Equipus Total. We're so excited about what's happening in church and we pray that you are blessed by this message. Doing and speaking on faith fundamentals and the subject that is uh, going to be addressed this morning is the whole one of forgiveness. Let me begin by telling you a story and uh, there was a man who was bitten by a dog that had rabies and in, in, in absolute panic, if you will, that man, he ran off to see a very kind doctor and the doctor said to him, yes, you've, you've, I'm sorry, but the news is all bad. You've, you've, your dog that bit you had rabies indeed and, and, um, and so I'm sorry, but you haven't got long to live. And so the man um, suddenly burst out and he said, do you have a pencil and paper? And, and rather perplexed, the doctor said, certainly, went and found a pencil and paper and gave it to the man and he began to write furiously on this pencil, you know, on this piece of paper. And the doctor was perplexed and wondered, he said, listen, it's all right, you, you, you're not going to die in my office. You've got a few days left if you're doing your will or whatever you're doing. He said, don't panic, you've got a few days left. And um, with, with real anger and animosity, the guy said, I'm not writing out my will. I'm writing out all the names of the good people that I'm going to bite before I die. <laughs> Thank goodness you laughed. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. <laughs> you never know how these stories are going uh, to you know, go. But who knows? Who knows that that man needs to hear a sermon on forgiveness? Amen? I mean, he's got it really bad. And I know that there is no, I'm trusting, I'm hoping, I'm believing that there is nobody in this room that is suffering from the same level of unforgiveness as that man was. But we have a fantastic and a glorious God. And, and, um, and because of that, he has equipped us, enabled us, and given us, and, 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 and actually went to the cross. And on that cross, after he was beaten, after he was, you know, thrashed with the cat of nine tails, you know, after he had to carry that cross and put it all up, and in there he was nailed. And what are the words that he uttered? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So forgiveness is at the very heart of the very message of the gospel, and, and, um, and, it's, and there is a lot, I can honestly say, there is a lot said about the whole subject about forgiveness. And the reality is, is this, that if we don't practice uh, what God says about the Jesus has told us to do about the whole issue of forgiveness, then we're going to be handed over to the torturers. There's, a, there's an essence of, of, of why are we struggling to see a breakthrough take place. Maybe within healing, uh, within relationships, whatever it is, maybe there's a breakthrough. You know, you're struggling to see this breakthrough that come in. And I want to suggest to you today that maybe there's something that you are harboring against another person, may not be a Christian, may be a family member. You're harboring unforgiveness towards another person. And, and from what I've read in the Word of God, it is such a, such a powerful force that you need to let go because it's blocking things in your own life. You know, in John 10.10, 10, the, the Bible says that the devil came to steal, kill, and to destroy. Guess, who, guess who's the father of unforgiveness? Yes, he just loves to see, see the, the, the creation of, of Heavenly Father caught up in unforgiveness. But Jesus said this, I have come that you might have life and life in all its fullness. Depending on what version you read, it could be life in all abundance. Whatever it is, abundance, fullness, it's all good news. It's all good news. Jesus says, I have come that you might have life. And so unforgiveness is not part of a, of, of a life that is full of abundance. It is, it is a life that is caught up. It's almost like being handed over to the jailers. Such is the importance of understanding that we need to work through the whole issue of forgiveness with our fellow brethren. And so um, and my privilege to speak this morning upon the subject and to bring some remembrance of what the Word of God has to say about this really, really important subject. So first, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21. It's interesting this, that, that um, oh, maybe even before I go there, why don't we just do, because I'm a good Presbyterian boy, grew up in a Presbyterian church, so I know that when the speaker says, and uh, he, 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 he starts a line that all means the rest of us all have to say the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> so, 
And the same way the Lord taught us to pray, that's what the Presbyterians say, in the same way the Lord taught us to pray, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Sorry, it's my, my version. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our daily bread as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. And God bless the Presbyterians who taught me that. And so... Um, and so, you know, that, that, that essence of that prayer is fantastic. You'd have to agree. It's great. Except there's one line in it, which is not a nice line, really. You know, up to the point where, you know, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Uh, forgive us our trespasses. And then it comes to a sentence that without even stopping, forgive us our trespasses. And then it goes on to say, and forgive those that trespass against us. Suddenly there is this challenge within the Lord's Prayer that's talking to us personally, to us, you and I. If you have ought against your brother, you need to go to the Lord and forgive that person because it's causing you um, great consternation and more than what you probably realize. And, and, um, and so we'll, we'll talk about that as we go on. So there's the Lord's Prayer, um, and that's essentially what I'm talking about. So because, you see, within that Lord's Prayer, when he's talking, when, when Jesus has taught them to say, there's two aspects about forgiveness. One is about how God forgives us, and about how we forgive our neighbors, how we forgive others around us. And so that's the two essence. And in and, and, and Matthew chapter 18, Jesus tells a parable that begins to unpack this in a greater depth, and then it's that, to that parable that I wish to speak to. But just before that, pre-leading up into this parable, Jesus says this. He says, Lord, how many times shall... And actually, Peter says this, because it has to be Peter, doesn't it? No one else but Peter would actually think about asking the question, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive my brother or my sister? And, he, and, and so Peter, being in the bold sort of person, that is, he made a suggestion to Jesus uh, seven times. He said, I'll think about seven times. How many times should we forgive my brother or sister? Seven times, Peter says. And so what Peter, where did Peter get this idea of seven times from? Well, the, the teachers of that day, um, they used to teach that God can forgive you up to three times. So it's like, strike three and you're out. I don't know where out is, but, but um, nevertheless, that's what they taught, that the, the mercy and the grace of God finished after you've sinned or, 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 uh, th more than three times. And so Peter, thinking about this is what he's been taught, that God can forgive up to three times, he decided to go to Jesus and go, well, three, if I double that, that gives me six. Uh, let's, let's add another one in, just for good measure. And Jesus will think I'm really clever. So three, three, six, one, six. So seven times, Lord. How many times should I forgive my brother? And seven times, expecting a great slap on the world. That's really clever, Peter. Well done. And in fact, the, the response was this, that no, Peter, no. And it's shocked the whole world. You know, many, many Christians have stumbled over the, the, the response that Jesus gave. And Peter came to the Lord, how many times rather sin to get me? Next one, please, to 22. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. <laughs> uh, that's a long way off seven. If you go 70 times seven, you actually arrive at a figure of 490 times. Does that mean that God is sitting in heaven with a, with a bean counter? <laughs> going, Carl, woo -hoo, you're up to number 400. You've broken through 400, brother. <laughs> You've got 90 left to go. <laughs> you know, Teddy's up to about 488 with a husband, you know, and she's, you know. And so, um, you know, I mean, so, uh, you know, how many, how, 490 times in a marriage? <laughs> Did you bring the milk, honey, like I asked? Oh, no, darling. Mm, number of girl goes up to number five. <laughs> you know. We husbands, we have a certain manner about our marriage that's not always the most, um, anyway, whatever. And so it causes our wives some consternation sometimes and they are on their knees all the time, you know, seeking forgiveness to their husband, you know, whatever. Enough waffle. I'm just talking about Gail, not any other body. Anyway, anyway, whatever. So, so, so Jesus responds and he says, no, 77 times, 490 times. Could I have that next slide, please? God's mercy doesn't run out at 490 allotments of grace. So the, the theologians of today understand that when Jesus said that, he wasn't talking about a numerical limit. 
to how many times we ought to forgive our brothers and sisters. There's not this essence of reach 490 and that's all there is to God's grace. No, man, this just this absolutely doesn't make any sense at all. And so there's not a limit to God's grace over our lives. And man, we ought to jump up and down if we were, if we were young, you know, but we're not. You know, we'd jump up with excitement about the aspect about God's grace when it comes to the whole issue of forgiveness. And so it is that we, we go through life and sometimes we face people that aren't, that who do things that aren't nice. They're just, just not nice. And you wonder why they do it. And so now comes the challenge that we, have to, that we can choose, what are we going to do now with this offense? What are we going to do with this issue of resentment? And, and, and it's true that so often it comes from a, from a close member of the family or, or you know, church family, whatever. And so, um, and so there we go. So um, now, most yeah, both yeah, 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 wanting to repent. Yeah. So the, the the one issue is this: as long as we are willing to repent, the Lord will forgive. Not four hundred ninety times. As long as you are willing to repent, the Lord will forgive. I want you to walk away from this place, not with four hundred ninety in your pocket, but with an idea that if you repent, God will forgive. Doesn't matter how bad your husband is. God will forgive him. <laughs> if you, or you, then that's up to you to do the same thing. <laughs> anyway, he addressed two kinds of forgiveness. We, we go on from uh, Matthew 23, going on right through to verse 35. There is, he, tell, he begins to tell a parable. And, uh, and it's to that parable that I want to speak this morning and use it as my key text because Jesus is directly speaking to the subject. I don't know any other aspect of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus actually gives commentary on but he gives commentary on forgiveness. And it's in, as he's talking to the disciples and Peter and so forth in Matthew 18, 23, 22, 23 to 35, he addresses the whole subject by telling this parable about the king and his servant. And so let's look at verse 23. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Next verse, please. And he began to settle, as he began to settle, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. In other versions, it talks about 10,000 talents. And just as the NIV correctly says here, there is uh, 10,000 bags of gold. So actually, when you start to look at the weight of that, the, the immensity of that debt was so huge. Now, I'm a builder from way back. I am used to, uh, I have a, 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 a familiarity with the weight of a 20 kg bag of cement. And, and so, you know, in my younger days, you would pick it up and throw it on your shoulder and you would carry a 20, and so I measure everything by a bag of cement. That's the measure or that's the weight that I, I've got a, f a familiarity with. And so a, a, um, when he begins to talk about these, these, um, uh, these talents, each talent is worth somewhere between um, uh, th around about 30 kgs for the, for the guys. For the girls, I have no idea. It's, it's um, whatever, yeah, yeah, pr probably one of those things on the thing that you stand on, you know, you're probably familiar with that. So, 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 and so now you've got 30 kgs, but you've got 10,000 of them. So you can see the immensity of this debt that the servant had racked up. How is it? And I, and I began to think about it, and I thought, maybe this guy just loves flying first class on Emirates. I don't know. You know, He likes staying in the very best of the five- and six-star hotels that are around this place. Maybe he likes going on cruise. I don't know. Whatever it was in his day, somehow, I reckon he must have had the king's uh, credit card. Because how else would he have amassed such... Anyway, but, but that's detail that Jesus wasn't asking us to get into. He was wanting to draw our attention to the enormity of that debt for a reason. This is what happens. King says to the son, to the, to the servant, I need you to repay that debt. And of course, the servant had no chance of being able to do that. Let's go to 25. 
And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had sold to repay the debt. So what happens in, 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 in those days was this, that if a man was unable to pay his debt, so, so um, if I owed Pastor Carl here a whole bunch of money and he came to me one day and he asked me to repay that debt, if I could not repay it, he had every right to, tell, to sell Gail, Anna, Melissa, Sam, chuck them all in prison, and me, and put us up for sale. And then not only that, he could go to our house, which is quite a nice house, I have to say. Yeah, and he, they'd probably move in. Yeah, yeah, you'd just probably move in. Anyway, but for the sake of the story, um, all, the, all that servant's possessions, the king had a right to sell. And so the servant sitting there watching his wife, his children, all his earthly possessions are being carried out of his house to, for the king to be sold. And so suddenly this man realizes the error of his ways. And let's have a look at what happens. At this, this the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. Well, you know, in New Zealand, fortunately, we don't sell people's wives and, hus and ch husbands and, and children. We don't do that process. What we have is, 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 a, is, a, is a whole thing called bankruptcy. <laughs> it, I hope none of you have ever been through it because, uh, well, I haven't, so, but I've seen people that have and it just s controls so much part of your life from, from, if you ever want to go into business. After that, bankruptcy is a terrible thing. But losing your wife and your kids and all your possessions, maybe bankruptcy is not so bad. But they didn't have bankruptcy back then. They just had the soul, they just sold what was precious to the person who owed you the money, the servant, his wife and his family. So let, what happened next? The servant's master took pity on him and cancelled the debt and let him go. Come on. We got a pile. We got you know, this whole area covered in gold, bags and bags of gold. Such was the enormity of the debt. And the king moved by compassion. Does it say that? This master took pity on him. And mother verse it talks about, and the king was moved to compassion when he saw his servant Sit on his knees before him, begging for mercy. And the king forgave his entire debt. You know, the king didn't go, all right, so there's 10,000 talents there that you have to pay back. He didn't go through a process of dividing. Well, let's break that down into 10 lots and say 1,000 of each. So let, let's address for the next three years paying back that 1,000. Then, then, uh, then three years after that, you, you know, he didn't do any of that. He didn't address it like, like any normal bank manager would do today. He, they would break down the debt into smaller parcels that what you can manage and you tick each one of those off as you go through life. But this king completely and utterly forgave the whole debt. Sound familiar? I should hope so. Next verse. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. Now, what you've got to understand here is Jesus telling this parable is that on the one hand, you've got one servant who has got this 10,000 talents of debt. A denarii, which is what this other servant had, there are 6,000 denarii to one talent. How many, how many denarii did this guy have? He had a, a hundred. There was a member, there was a hundred denarii. This guy owned a hundred denarii back, the, the, the coinage of the day. So, so, that's, so Jesus is showing you how small this debt was. You, you understand where Jesus is coming from when he's telling the parable? Over here, the big debt. Over here, the, the little debt, 100 denarii, 6,000 denarii to make up one talent. Follow that through, 10,000 talents, debt over here, 100 denarii over here, such a small, tiny debt. The servant that had been forgiven all that colossal debt has now gone back to approach the other servants around him, his fellow workmates, and found one who's owed him a tiny debt. It's like, like, like if I can put the, the, the distance from from here to the moon or the sun is that debt over here. This debt over here is like 300 mils long. 
do you, do you see the, the, what I'm trying, the analogy I'm trying to draw here? To show you just how small, just how small, how big, how small. How big, how small, how big, how small. How big and how small. And it should be how big and how small. Anyway, another side for a sermon for another time. And so, and so Jesus telling this parable. And so the next verse, tell me, show me what happens. And this fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Here's this next servant do, almost using exactly the same words as this other servant used to beg the king for forgiveness. Here's this servant begging forgiveness from his, 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 his senior servant and saying, I will pay it back. Next verse. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. What is wrong with that man? You know, if we look at just in the context of this being a story only, what, you know, it's, 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 you, you, you know, where is this guy coming from? Here he has been forgiven all this debt. Now he can't even forget a tiny little wee few dollars that this other man owns. You know, where, where is his head? So next verse. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, and they went and told their master everything that had happened. So the squealers got involved. <laughs> Nice to have friends like that, is it not? You know, you know, and and so it's it's just 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 go on. It's just incredible. It's just you got to understand. Jesus is telling a parable here, and what he's doing, he's talking to us this morning. He wrote a parable that was would go on forever, a timeless parable, a timeless teaching. Next verse, please. Verse 32. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant. He said, I cancelled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Next verse, please. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Of course, we would all have done. You know, we would have done, would we not? L Lance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, next, next one. We'll move on too quickly before we fall into a hole there, Lance. Okay, next one. And anger his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all they own. Final verse says this. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Jesus telling this parable, and what he's trying to get across is this, that on, the, on Calvary, Jesus died for each of us. Our, our sin... Our, our, it was so huge that on the death of Calvary, Jesus died and set us free from the death of sin. How much should we then, therefore, when someone sins against us, should we not also forgive them? Because in the light of what Jesus has done for us, how can we not forgive people around us who have hurt us? Now, I know it's hard. I know it's hard to forgive somebody who has really offended you, who's called great resentment towards you. It's not easy to do what Jesus is teaching through this parable for us to do. It can be difficult. I accept that. But the consequences of not doing as Jesus instructs us to do, a colossal, a, a huge, in terms of, see, God has a plan for our lives. He honestly does. He has a plan for our lives. And, and it's a good plan. It's a plan that's going to prosper you, and, 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 and you're gonna, you, you, you love it. It's, it's not like something that you can walk away from. It's going to sit on you wherever you go, whatever you do. God's plan for you. From the moment you were conceived, even before that in your mother's womb, there was this essence of the plan of God on your life. You can't walk away from it. Can you walk away from God? No, he's omnipresent. He's always there. <laughs> he's always there. Omnipresent. He's always there. And this life that he has for you is always there there for you it's a good life it's a life full of abundance 
It's a happy life. But I know living our lives here on this planet, people do stuff around us that we don't like. So Jesus is saying, look, don't lose sight of the fact that the life that I have for you is in all its fullness and all its abundance. It's, it's there for you. What you've done through unforgiveness, you're causing a, a, a blockage to access that life. And so what you're doing is you're placing yourself into jail. So, you know, so, so Dory, my dear friend, you know, Dory, if I use this for an example, if I say something to Dory that really offends her, she can harbor that for a long time. I don't know that I've offended Dory. I have no idea. I probably do it on a regular basis, darling, don't I? You know, anyway, so, but, but I have no knowledge whatsoever of the fact that I've offended Dory. But Dory's stewing every day. <laughs> she has got the nev pot out and she is stirring that offense up, stirring that resentment up because she doesn't want to forgive. But what she doesn't understand is what we have to understand is the whole point of forgiveness is to set us free. Yeah, that's right. not, the, not the person that's offended you. The whole point, this is the marvelous. The, the, the marvelous planning of Jesus for our lives is that he wants to set us free, not only on the Calvary, but on every day that we're offended. He wants to set us free. He wants to set us free. He wants to take you out of bondage, out of the jail. He's the, he's the, he's the heavenly Father that's got the key to access your freedom. And all you have to do is get a piece of paper and as Dory says, I'm going to go and bite Neville. I'm going to bite Neville. I'm going to bite Neville. I'm going to bite Neville. No. <laughs> On a piece of paper, I want you to think about. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to ask the musos to come up. I just want to draw. No, we won't. Do we, no, no. Say, say. <laughs> I've got, a, I've, <laughs> I've got another great story. I've got to finish with another great story, and then we'll pick up because I, I, I know what'll happen. If, 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 if come, come. Uh, you know, time to, to leave here. You'll all leave here, as I've done a thousand times before, and everything that the preacher has preached is gone. And so, what I want, I want us to do something. We will. Just remind me, because I'm very, I'm slightly senile these days and very forgetful. But right. So anyway, story, story. The so th there's this, uh, there's, there's Milan, Italy, north northwestern uh, Italy, Milan. Uh, known for its designer, everything, cars, kitchens, clothing, everything. Milan, if you're into, into fashion and design, you head off to Milan, as, as I have done. And, um, and so w when Gail and I were there a while, yeah, some time ago, um, you know, the Statue of David, just amazing, just incredible. All the architecture, just amazing, just incredible. Just the, um, I don't even remember the name of it, the, 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 the great shopping arcade, you know, with the bulls. Uh, uh, look it up on Google and giggle, because I can't tell you what that means. Um, <laughs> anyway, but the, there is a painting that Leonardo da Vinci was, was commissioned to paint, and he decided to paint a picture of the Last Supper, and uh, this is what it looks like. And on the right, on the far... On the far side, on, the far, on, 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 on your left, is Bartholomew. I haven't memorized it all, but that's Bartholomew over there. Um, this here is James. There's ja James. There's, next, next is Andrew. Who's this dude? Clue. You're clueless. Oh, that's it. Oh, hey. The power that's in that finger, I tell you. Oh, oh. That's Judas. He's got his hand on the money bag. I suppose you fellas can't even see any of that stuff. So, yeah, so that's Judas. Um, and then we've got John. And then, of course, we've got Jesus. And then we've got uh, Thomas. Um, and then... Um, James, 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 Philip, Matthew, Thaddeus, 
and Simon. So there they all are, all sitting up there. And, um, uh, and so Leonardo was commissioned to paint this painting. Um, I should probably make sure that I have my notes in case I forget it. But anyway, I'll do the best I can. So, so he commissioned this painting. And so away he goes. He decides he's going to paint the Last Supper. And, um, and he starts painting this. He gets through to the point of needing to paint a face on Judas. Now, what you've got to understand is, oh, heavens sake, don't, who, oh, huh. Well, it's only a few thousand dollars, it's all right. Um, I, something worse, I could pick it up and play it for you, that would be even a worse sound. Okay, and so, and so he, he got to the point of tr- trying to paint Judas's face. And you see, what you got to understand is, is that um, also in, in Italy, there was this great painter called Leon, um, um, uh, Michelangelo. He, he had a bit to do with painting most a lot of Italy as well. And so you've got Leonardo and Michelangelo. Leonardo's commissioned to make this painting. Leonardo and Michelangelo uh, eh, uh, 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 got resentment against one another. They, 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 there's almost like a professional jealousy that was going on. Some of the commentators say there's like a, uh, um, you know, oh, man, he's so good. Oh, I hate the way that he does that so well, you know. And, and so there was, this, um, there was this anger that went on between the two great painters of Italy. And so Leonardo came up with this idea, I know what I'll do. I'll paint Michelangelo's face on Judas. You'd appreciate that, Trev, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, and so he, painted, he painted Michelangelo um, on, on, the head of, on the head up here. And so what was happening was, you know, to make this painting takes a, takes a little bit of time to, to do it. And so, uh, so people were coming by to have a look to see how he's getting on. And they were shocked to see that Leonardo had painted the face of Michelangelo on the head of, or on, on Judas, uh, representation onto Judas. And um, uh, he didn't care. And so, but then he came to paint the, so he did, he did Jesus' body and everything else. And then he came to paint the face of Jesus. And he was really struggling because he understood that, you know, he, you know, he understood the compassion, the love, the eyes, all that. So how do I paint all of that? And so he tried different things and he ended up rubbing them all out because none of them quite represented what he was looking for. So in the end, he gave up and he, and he decided to pray. So he asked the Lord, Lord, please help me to paint your face on this painting and um, the Lord spoke to his heart he says you're not going to see my face until you fix the face that you've painted onto Judah suddenly conviction came upon him he realized what he was doing he had this unforgiveness towards Michelangelo and so it wasn't until he went back with a rubber whatever you artists use, a um, whole lot of mess, whatever, and wiped the face of Judas off and painted the face that we see to, the, the, to this very day. That was not the face that was painted onto Judas. Then, once that was gone and he'd repainted it, he was able to finally paint the picture of Jesus. He felt the freedom within his own giftings to finally be able to capture the face of Jesus and to paint it. Folks, I want to tell you this. You're never going to see the face of Jesus while you've got resentment towards others. You're never going to see the face of Jesus while you carry resentment towards others. Let's stand.